We have the pleasure to introduce Jack Thompson. Jack is doing his PhD with Serena Zero and Enrico Lazanochi in the University of Western Australia. He's working on partial differential equations. And he's going to talk about some problems involving non local equations and over determined problems. So, Jack, whenever you want, go to it. Thank you, Clara. So, um, thank you for inviting me and um, thank you to the organizers for running this seminar. So today I'm going to be talking about um, a problem in PEs known as overdetermined problems. So the idea is we want to start off with a PE that's well posed and we essentially are going to add extra conditions on our solution um, and see what happens. So the idea is somehow the PE models a physical phenomena and the overdetermined condition models something that's useful in application, some kind of optimal condition. So um, you can see these problems are very related to shape optimization problems. So I'll, I'll begin with an example, and it's the most famous example in this area. So it's called Seren's problem, and the idea is we have a domain of omega in Rn. We have a domain of omega in Rn, and we have a solution, uh, we have a function u from omega to r. Okay, and we're going to assume that u satisfies that it has um, constant Laplacian in omega, and it has zero boundary conditions. So here, just so everyone remembers, the Laplacian is the sum of the pure second derivatives. Now, we're also going to impose the, the Neumann um, that U satisfies on the boundary that its um, Neumann derivative is constant. So the derivative in the direction of the normal is constant. And then, so this problem here, without this overdetermined condition, is just a well-posed problem. If for any reasonable omega, you can find a solution and it's unique. Now, when I add this extra condition, this is not going to be satisfied for every single omega. So the question becomes, well, what can we say about omega? And in this case, this problem was um, addressed by James Serin, um, and he was able to prove that omega is a ball. Okay. Now, um, the motivation for this problem comes actually for him, it came from fluid dynamics. So the idea was he had a pipe and omega was the cross section and then he had laminar flow through the pipe and you can show that in this context so in this case n was two um u was the so-called streamline function and in this context u satisfies this and this was um an important condition because it somehow referred to um, the stress on the side of the pipe so this was um, kind of a condition for the strongest pipe. Okay, so yeah, so in 1971, um, James Serin looked at this problem and was able to prove that um, if you have a solution that satisfies all three of these conditions, then the actual domain omega has to be a ball. And this was this problem kind of opened up this whole um, area of overdetermined PE. So I'm going to refer to this kind of um, theorem as a rigidity result. So rigidity means some kind of classification of um, the regions which admit solution to the PD and the overdetermined conditions. Now, what was really um, beautiful about this theorem was not so much maybe the statement, but the technique that he used to prove it. So um, he, he refined a, a technique that was um, introduced by Alexandrov um, to prove um, a theorem in geometry. Um, and it's now, um, he refined it, and it's now known as the method of moving planes. So I'm going to discuss this in more detail um, later. But the... Um, the method of moving planes has become a standard technique in PD for proving symmetry results. Okay, so um, 
I'm going to be talking about some uh, generalizations of this problem. So there are several generalizations. So like I say, it opened up an entire new field. But um, so for example, people consider these um, problems on manifolds um, with nonlinear equations, um, different operators and different overdetermined conditions. For me, I'm going to focus on the the second two, the, the last two, sorry. So I'm going to consider different overdetermined conditions, and we're going to talk about something called the parallel surface problem, and also different operators. So in this context, the, the fractional and the passing. Okay. So first of all, let's discuss the the parallel surface problem. So now I want to think about a specific case where my omega is a particular type of region in that I start with a region G and then I take this Minkowski sum, this A plus B, um, with a ball of radius R. And what this essentially does is it creates a region omega where omega is essentially G, but just moved out. So this boundary of G here and this boundary of omega are parallel and they're at a distance R from one another. Okay. And in this context, instead of imposing that I have constant um, Neumann condition on the boundary, I'm instead going to impose that my solution to my PD is constant on the boundary of G. So I have this surface where I'm constant. Now, um, you can argue that this problem is a, a discrete form of the original problem, because if you imagined I had an infinite um, collection of an infinite families of these um, of these parallel surfaces, and on each of them I imposed that there were it was my solution was a constant. That in the limit I get some sort of condition on my Neumann derivative. But in fact, I don't need infinitely many of them. I just need one. Okay, that's the parallel surface problem, um, and the. Different operator is the fractional Laplacian. So this is a generalization of the usual Laplacian. Um, it's a non-local operator. So by non-local, so we, we refer to the Laplacian as local because to define the Laplacian is just derivatives. And to define a derivative at a point, you just need to know the function in any neighborhood of the point, okay? But you can see already from this definition in order to define um, the fractional Laplacian of U at a point, you actually need to know the value of the function everywhere in Rn. And the moment I change the value of U very far away, this has an effect close by. So you have interactions very far away. Um, and why is it called the fractional Laplacian? Well, it satisfies these nice properties. It satisfies a semi-group property where if I compose, Fractional Laplacians, it's the same as adding the power. And also in the limit S back up to one, I, in some sense, recover the original Laplacian. Okay, so for the fractional Laplacian, we consider um, this problem here. So you can see that this line is analogous. Well, it's the same as the first line in the other problem. On this line, we have U is zero, but in the complement. And we have to do the complement because it's a non-local operator and somehow the fractional Laplacian needs to see all of that information. Okay, and then we have two different overdetermined conditions that we can look at. So one, we can look at the, analog um, the, the analogous problem to Seren's problem, which is we assume that this term here is constant on the boundary. Now, this is essentially the Neumann derivative um, for the fractional Laplacian, but it's well known that solutions of this equation are not linear at the boundary. They're only holder continuous. So if you take the normal, the usual Neumann derivative, it's plus or minus infinity. So instead you have to consider a holder Neumann derivative. Okay, so on one hand, we could assume this is constant. And then on the other hand, for the parallel surface problem, 
There's no issue with this. You can just assume U is constant on that parallel surface. So that was a lot of information. So to sort of summarize everything, we have two columns and two rows. Um, the columns we have local, non-local, and all that's changing is we've got an S here, an S equals one here, and then, okay, we have this complement as opposed to the boundary. But then from Seren's problem to the parallel surface problem, we have a constant Neumann condition. And then parallel surface problem we have, we impose that our function is constant on parallel surface. Now, we wanna talk about the rigidity of um, these problems. So what, what regions omega satisfy these equations? Given there's a solution to these problems, what can we say about omega? And the answer is in all four of them, omega has to be a ball, in all four of them. So um, the original, the top left corner was the, the result of Seren that I mentioned earlier. But then over the years, um, all of these other ones have been filled in. So you'll see after Seren, um, the other three were done very recently. So um, the parallel surface problem for the non-local, uh, sorry, for the local was Chiraulo, Magnanini, and Sakaguchi in 2015. And then we have Fal and Jarosh for the non-local Seren's problem in 2015. And then there are two papers for the non-local parallel surface problem. So in this first paper with Chiralo, Di Piero, Pogesi, Palastro, Valdonacci, they did... If I go back... Okay, yep. They did exactly this problem with one on the right-hand side in this paper here, um, which includes me, we did this problem, but we had, it was semi-linear. Okay, we added a semi-linearity. Okay, so, and that changes up some of the analysis, um, which I'll um, talk about in a moment. Okay, so these are sort of the um, four or five papers um, on the rigidity results. Now, how does the proof go? So I'll focus on, um, the non-local parallel surface problem, because that's the one that I actually had involvement in. Um, so the idea, and this is the idea of the method of moving planes, is we're going to introduce um, a direction E and a parameter U and a plane. Okay, so I did have an animation here, but maybe is it better to have the animation or draw it on the board for Zoom? Okay. I'll just try the animation and we'll see, see what happens. Okay. Can you see that on Zoom? Oh. If I hide. Um, okay, so this, this is just supposed to represent some kind of region. And this line here is my plane. And the idea is I start my plane on the right and I move it to the left, okay? And then at some point, I'm gonna strike my region. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the right-hand portion and reflect it over to the left, okay? Uh, and so at this point, there's no PDEs. This is purely geometric. Um, and at some point here, I'm going to strike the boundary and I'm going to want to, my reflection wants to leave. Now, the essence of the proof is that what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my solution to my PDE and I'm going to create an odd function by reflecting it across the boundary. And in this region, I satisfy some linear PDE. And the idea is that through maximum principles, I should be able to argue at this point here, my function, my, my reflected function is zero. So, so my original function is um, symmetric with respect to this reflection. And then because the direction I picked was arbitrary at the start, this leads to an argument that 
I have to be symmetric with every direction, therefore I must be a ball to start with. So geometrically, there are two situations that can happen. This is the first one where I reflect and at some point I internally strike my boundary. Now, the second case that can happen is if I have this kind of egg looking shape and I keep reflecting, I keep reflecting. And then at some point here, my reflection wants to push outwards like this. So geometrically, these are the two cases that um, can occur. So I'll go back to my slides. So, the, so yeah, to reiterate, the goal is to prove that my reflected function is zero at this critical time, where the critical time was when I reflected, I kept pushing it, and then I, I couldn't go further without leaving my domain. Now, the, the first step in all of this is actually, okay, to prove something weaker, that my I'm not zero at the critical time, but in fact, I'm non-negative at every time before the critical time. So I'm, my reflective function is always non-negative. And this is through maximum principles. So, okay, when I reflect, um, so maybe it's not clear how I got this, but you can obtain a linear PDE of your ref reflected function. Okay, and in our specific situation, so I've got the C here, when that right-hand side was semi-linear, you get a C, but when, it's, when the right-hand side was one, C is zero, okay? So in this simplified case, when the right-hand side was one, C is zero, and so you're S harmonic, which is good. Okay, so there's a lot of notation. The essentially this omega nu prime is just my omega reflected onto the other side. And the h nu is just the half plane on the other side. Okay, so this is just saying I satisfy some PDE in the reflected region and I'm non-negative in on in one half plane. Okay, so this is what I'm saying in the case where the right hand side in the original problem is one, C is zero. So let's just let's just do that case because that's simpler. Now, in the local case, so let's say S was one here and this is non-negative on the boundary. If if I have a if I have a function that's non-negative on the boundary, this S harmonic, the maximum principle tells me my function is non-negative, which is what I want to show. Now, it's not so simple for the fractional Laplacian because um, the, the maximum principle for the fractional Laplacian says I have to be non-negative in all of Rn or in the complement. Okay, but I'm also odd with respect to a plane. So the only function that's non-negative everywhere and odd is zero. Okay, so that's kind of useless because that's what we want to show. So you have to obtain a... a um, a non-local maximum principle that uses this fact that you're symmetric with respect to this um, plane. And this is what was obtained in Fowler and Jarosch in 2015. Um, and they showed, okay, in this context, yes, V is non-negative. Okay. Now, step two is by contradiction. Okay, so you assume, um, okay, now you're non-negative, so you use the strong maximum principle and say you're either zero or um, everywhere, or you have, um, sorry, if you have a zero in the interior, you're zero everywhere. So you're either strictly positive in omega lambda prime, or you're um, zero everywhere. And you assume for contradiction that you're strictly positive. Now, in case one, this was when my, um, my reflective region internally struck the other boundary. Um, in the parallel surface problem, I'm assuming U is constant on this parallel surface. So when I evaluate um, my function V at this point here, 
okay, u is a constant, the reflection of u is here, which is also the same constant. So therefore my v is zero at this point, which contradicts my assumption that v was positive. Okay. Now, the second case was this, this other, ge so the, the second geometric situation is when I'm this egg shape. Um, and in this case, um, on one hand, because my U is constant on this parallel surface, I can argue that the derivative across, at this point here, across this line has to be zero. Okay, so somehow I need to obtain a contradiction to this statement. And you do this by coming up with a non-local analog of the Hopf lemma. So the Hopf lemma um, in classical PDE says that if I'm positive and I'm harmonic, um, then I can't approach the boundary. Um, I have to approach it at least linearly. Okay, so I have to have, a, my, my derivative has to have a sign at the boundary. Now in the non-local case, so here, I was coming across here um, and I'm still able to show that this, my function has to have a sign across this boundary. The, sorry, the derivative has to have a sign, which is in contradiction to this statement here. Okay, so this is sort of the overall um, idea of the rigidity result. It's different when it's not the parallel surface problem, because then in this situation, you don't have the parallel surface, but the point you have to consider is on the boundary here. Uh, and so in the original Seren's problem, he had to come up with this new hot lemma um, called Seren's corner lemma. Um, and there was this kind of dichotomy and you could either, there had to be two situations that happened and he showed that in his particular case, neither happened and he obtained a cotton contradiction. Okay. So, um, yeah, so the next part of my talk, so this is, so that's the first part and um, the next part, and this is sort of getting to the open problems section of the talk, is to um, discuss the stability of these types of problems. So I show you, okay, if I have the over the term condition, then I'm a ball. So now the question is, suppose I have a solution to my PDE um, and in some sense, I almost satisfy my over the term condition. Can I say that my omega is almost a ball? Now, of course, you have to be precise about these things. You have to quantify what do you mean by almost in both of these two situations? Okay, so um, for the parallel surface problem, so in actually in all of the problems, this row of omega is um, how we define um, how close omega is to being a ball. So at the end of the day, all row of omega is, is that, okay, we pick a point P in omega, we take the biggest possible ball um, inside omega, the um, smallest possible ball on the outside, and then we take the infimum overall P. So we have some sort of situation. I'm not sure if I've managed to do the optimum one there. But <laughs> that's kind of the idea, right? Um, and then o o omega, um, rho of omega is this distance here. Right? So when rho of omega is zero, I have to be a ball. Okay. Um, and how do we measure u being constant uh, or being close to being constant on the boundary is we, we have this sort of Lipschitz type norm um, where we, we look at the difference of u um, and we take we go we take values x and y over the boundary of g.
Okay, so here are the sort of the summary of the results so far. So this this one here is really the original um, stability results. Um, and these guys were the, the first ones to even consider this kind of idea. So this is for the original Serens problem, right? So um, in this case, if I had constant Neumann derivative on the boundary, then, then this gives a rho of omega is... So, um, yeah, so then this will go to zero and rho of omega will be zero. So omega would be a ball. Now you see, um, unfortunately, they get a, a log term here. As, so they have a power and they have a log. And this is because um, the assumption on the boundary is, is subtle. So you have to, um, when you apply your techniques, you have to go right up to the boundary and this introduces error. So how, how do these proofs actually work? You kind of want to rerun the argument that I did on the board uh, sorry, before with the method of moving planes. But at every step, when you use something qualitative, like the strong maximum principle, for example, you want to replace it with something quantitative, like the Harnack inequality. And so you want to, every time you make this a qualitative statement in the rigidity argument, you want to keep a track of um, how close you can be, like um, quantify the error in, in these statements. So, okay, so this is the original one. Um, the second one here was um, the parallel service problem. And um, so this was again done by Chiralo, Magnanini, and Sakaguchi. Um, and this is the inequality they obtained. So what I want to um, point out here is the exponent is one. Okay, and, and this is kind of believable because my parallel surface is in the interior of my domain. And if I'm harmonic, then I'm smooth. And so um, these two things have the same order. So if you start thinking about um, perturbations of a ball and then taking the perturbation to zero, these two things go to zero at the same rate. Okay, now I'll get back to this one later. The non-local one, something bad happens. So we try and run through these arguments and this is essentially the inequality we get. Okay, so it's very similar to this one here, but now we've got this power one on S plus two. And, and this is disappointing because Formally, you would hope that when s equals one, we would recover the original result. But when s equals one here, I get a power of one third. Now, it's also annoying because, okay, I made this argument that this is reasonable because of interior regularity. The interior regularity for the fractional case is the same as the, the non-fractional case. So you still get smooth, uh, your functions are still smooth in the interior. So the conjecture should be, is that this should be one. But the, the real issue comes out from the fact that the non-local case sees um, information that's, um, that's far away. And when you have these sort of reflected regions like this, okay, what can happen is your function, okay, and then I have this parallel surface. At this point here, you can obtain, okay, in this case, it's not a cusp, but in case two, you can obtain cusps. And my fractional Laplacian sees sees the information in this region. And this leads to um, errors when you actually make these um, estimates. Okay, in the local case, the local case doesn't care. Local case doesn't see it. Now, um, the last 
result we've obtained here is the, the non-local Serens problem. Um, and we obtain something very similar. You see, we get the same um, power there. Now, something as well to mention, and so this is coming to the end of my talk. This is the, the last slide is we can actually um, improve some of these results. Now, the best we can essentially do is double the exponent. I want to say it in quotation marks. So we still don't recover the, um, the same thing. So here the power is one, um, here the power is, uh, if S equals one, the power is one on three. If I double it, I get two on three. I still don't get the optimal thing. But um, in order to do that, we have to assume uniform um, regularity. So we have to put uniform regularity assumptions on the boundary. Okay. And I say formally we can double the exponent because you need to take the, the alpha in your uniform regularity to infinity to get double the exponent. So you need to have some kind of uniform C infinity assumption on the regularity of the boundary. Okay, so in order to double the exponent. And maybe that's reasonable in this case because I've got this assumption on the boundary, but this is kind of frustrating in this case because this term here is not on the boundary. This is, this object is measuring stuff in the interior. So it's frustrating that for some reason, boundary regularity plays a very important role in what exponent we get. Now, the last maybe little thing to mention, so um, so these papers are, are, are very recent. So I've, I've mentioned all of these authors, but this is actually two papers here. So the first paper is um, Chirao, Di Piero, Borgesi, Palastro, and Valdonocci, and they did 2023. And that was in the case, the right-hand side was one. And then recently I submitted a paper with uh, Serena, um, Giorgio and um, Enrico, where we did the, the um, semi-linear right-hand side, but we also did this improvement in exponent given extra boundary regularity. And this one was submitted um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, something like that. So it's very, very um, recent. But um, the final little comment is that, interestingly, formally, the exponent we get here is actually better than in the local case. Because in this case, we've got these logarithm um, terms, but somehow here we've got an improvement. So um, that's something that we're not sure why that occurs either. So um, anyway, so this is um, the end of my talk. The, um, yeah, so thank you everyone for listening. Yeah, so it comes down to the fact that um, it's not super um, complicated, but it comes down to the fact. So now you've got. Um, so now you've got. So now if I have my function is um, across every, so you pick the direction and you know that at the critical time it's anti-symmetric. So now if you consider kind of driving along one line in that direction, you've got your function looks like, so this is like omega, and then I know that my function, um, I know that my function v is zero out of here because I'm out of omega. And then if this is like my critical plane, 
Um, I've shown that, and I've shown that V is um, zero, right? But then I'm only coming up to, You have to think about it. It's it's not it's not so hard to argue like this, but the, the, the proof is escaping me for a second. Yeah. So it depends on the manifold, um, but there are non-examples on some manifolds and curvature actually starts to play a very important role um, in this because, um, so there's this really nice proof um, of um, Weinberger of the original Serens problem and he uses the Bochner identity, so. So, yeah, I'm gonna have to try to remember this. It's like, in Rn, it's like this, but, uh, and he uses in a non-trivial way that to, to use us through this, because okay, in the Seren case, this was one, so then this term goes to zero and uses um, some non-negativity of these sorts of things. But in the Riemannian case, an extra reach term. And so you can redo his argument assuming lower bounds on reaching. But then the question is, okay, what well, if you don't assume that and there are non-examples? There are counter-examples. Sorry, what did you replace there? What was your neural operator? Like an anisotropic. Yeah, so um, it, that hasn't been done yet. I wouldn't, well, okay, I don't believe you would get a ball, but maybe you could argue that you would get something else. But um, it does become complicated because the question is how, how would you get, how would you reason that you would get whatever other shape you get, because it very much relied on this symmetry in every direction, which is like a unique thing for the ball. But it's a good question, yeah. Because um, to some extent, you do only use, yeah, like the maximum principle, the harmonic inequality, these sorts of things, which are valid in many other situations. Yeah, that, well, that's the, that's, the, that's the main thing, that it's the reflection at the start. Uh, 